Well, thank you all for coming. So today we're going to talk about section C, D, and E of the elevation certificate. There are actually more sections to the elevation certificate, but they are seldom used. So I haven't developed a special class for those. I don't think I could talk about them for an hour. So uh, one of those sections, section G, is when a community official uh, includes information on the elevation certificate after a surveyor's filled it out. And we just don't see that happen very much. Now, this is a slide that about three quarters of people on this uh, call have seen twice already before, but have to give a little intro at the beginning of each class because each one could be taken separately. So the elevation certificate is a form that's signed by uh, either an, a professional engineer or a licensed land surveyor. The instructions on the FEMA form say that architects are allowed to do them. Architects are allowed to do elevation certificates in other states, but they are not allowed to do it in the state of Kansas. And that was a ruling made by the Board of Technical Professionals for the state of Kansas. And the Board of Technical Professionals, basically they oversee people like architects, engineers, and surveyors. Uh, professional engineers, licensed land surveyors have to complete continuing education credit hours and turn them in. Uh, periodically to the board. Now, elevation certificates are used as a supporting document for letter map amendment. They are not in themselves a letter map amendment. They can be used to support one. So just because a person has an elevation certificate, a map will not change. Elevation certificates are also used in writing of flood insurance. And we're going to talk about flood insurance a little bit because if you uh, know some tricks to elevation certificates and how to save people money on flood insurance, I think they will appreciate you saving them money. The elevation certificate is also used by community officials, and we have a lot of community officials on this call. So you would be reviewing elevation certificates when you're issuing permits to make sure that the things that were permitted were built correctly. Some real quick terminology. The top of the bottom floor, if I was to go down in the basement and stand on it and stomp my foot, I would be stomping my foot on the top of the bottom floor. We actually have had more than once, it actually happened three times, I'm sorry to tell you this, but we had somebody who built a house in the floodplain and they built a house with a basement, which they weren't supposed to do, but they didn't understand this business of top of the bottom floor. They went down in the basement and they said, I'm on the bottom floor and they pointed their finger up at the ceiling and they said, and that's the top of it up there. So they actually thought they had built their house correctly when they had not. So that's a terminology thing. And we need to be sure that we are clear with our customers who are our citizens and our clients who are trying to build in the floodplain that they understand what's expected. A basement by FEMA definition is below grade on all four sides. So, so something, so my house that I was broadcasting from the other day has a walkout basement. That's what my real estate agent calls it, but it's cut into the side of the hill. And so one side is completely open. So because that one side is completely open and not below grade, it's not considered a basement by FEMA definition. If it's used for like, if you had garage doors on it, you parked a car down there or you stored Christmas decorations down there, but it wasn't finished. FEMA would basically call it an enclosed area below the lower, lowest floor and treat it as a full story crawl space, essentially. If it was finished and there was living areas down there, then it's not a crawl space anymore. It would become the main floor of the house, the lowest floor for insurance rating purposes. Okay, now section C of the elevation certificate is that part of the form where elevation information is included. That's not too hard to understand. Section A was, was the building information. Section B was the flood map information. Section C is the elevation information. <coughs> Here's section C1 of the form here, snipped and clipped into the picture. You can do an elevation certificate based on construction drawings, actually under construction buildings or finished construction. Almost every community in Kansas requires an elevation certificate when the construction is complete so they can make sure it was done right. Some communities will ask for an elevation certificate before they issue a permit. That would be based on construction drawings because no construction has started yet. And they want to verify that what is going to be built will be built correctly. There are a few communities, usually communities that have building codes, where they will ask for an elevation certificate 
after the foundation is poured. Because you know, once the foundation is poured, if they've poured that to the correct level, then the rest of the house built on top of it will be to the correct level. If the foundation is not built right and you catch it at that point, it's not too late. We have had whole entire houses that were built to the wrong elevation because of various types of mistakes. There's a picture here and it shows a stake driven in the ground. I've got a lot of stake pictures actually. It's not an uncommon practice to put a stake in the ground and say build this high. There's a $400,000 home. It's west of here. It's in the western half of the state. And that $400,000 home, the, the surveyor drove a stake in the ground and he wrote two underscore feet and he put a mark on the stake. Well, two underscore feet means in surveyor terms, it means 2.4 feet, two foot and four tenths. Kind of like when you write a check and you're using the old fashioned paper checks and you'd write $2.40 and you'd put a little underscore underneath the 40 to say it was that's how much change it is. The contractor, the builder, misread the information on the stake. He thought the stake was saying 24 inches, not 2.4 feet. And so he built the house 24 inches high, which is only two feet. So I have a $400,000 house that got built four tenths of a foot too low. Had another situation in northeastern Kansas where a surveyor drove a stake in the ground and put a mark on it. He said, here's your mark, build to this level. Surveyor left. Dirt contractor hasn't arrived yet. Property owner took a big hammer and drove the stake down into the ground about an extra foot. Then when the building contractor arrived, he said, yep, you need to make the building pad as high as this mark on the stake, just like it says here on this, this stake. And then he tried to flim flam the surveyor when the building got built too low and have him sign off on an elevation certificate without remeasuring everything. The surveyor took one look at that stake and knew it had been altered he filled out a whole new elevation certificate that proved the building was too low. This is actually things that kind of happen. So, uh, Jacob, that's never happened to you, has it? You're on mute right now, but if you got a story, we'll ask you later. Now, here's a building under construction. This one is a this is a hamburger restaurant. It's what it is, and it's going to have a drive-up window. So this would be building under construction, pretty obviously. It's not finished construction. Now I did have one surveyor. The building was all done. The roof was on, the walls were on, the siding was on, the carpet was laid, the walls were painted. But he said the building wasn't finished yet because it didn't have the little plastic covers over the electrical light switches and the, the wall sockets. Um, you know, I'm not gonna get in a, in a hassle, the, the property owners want me to tell the surveyor it was finished and I'll, I'm just not gonna get involved in that argument. If this, as a surveyor and your professional opinion, the building's not finished, well, you're the one whose name is going on the form. So whatever you say goes, as far as I'm concerned. Now then, section C2, the first part of it, is gonna ask for information about the benchmark utilized. Most of you are familiar with survey benchmarks, and if you're lucky enough to have seen one, there are actually good brass discs laid out there in certain places that have been stamped with a little metal, metal tool, stamping tool that says how high they are and what latitude and longitude they are. There used to be one near my office in, in downtown Topeka, uh, right in the sidewalk. I've also seen two or three of them at a wildlife refuge right next to my farm. Now, each one of these survey marks should have a unique identifier number and be registered with the NGS. So I've seen elevation certificates where instead of a unique identifier number, it will just say something like chisel mark in bridge abutment. All right. Doesn't really say which bridge over what stream or what intersection of street. And so those kinds of things aren't really considered as good identifiers you need a unique identifier number. If you're not sure what the unique identifier number is, I suggest you go to the NGS website and find that benchmark on their website and it'll give it to you. It's also gonna ask you for the vertical datum for the benchmark. We have two types of datum. There's the National Geodetic Vertical Datum of 1929, the North American Vertical Datum of 1988. So if you have a benchmark like a, one of those brass discs and it was set into a piece of concrete as they were pouring a new bridge, and that's been there since 1975, well, then you're gonna know that was in that 1929 datum because 1988 datum didn't exist. 
why do we have two kinds of datum? Well, in 1929, they decided to map the whole country and create one set of vertical datum. And they based it off of mean sea level. Maybe you've heard that term mean sea level before. And mean sea level was based off of records that the Coast Guard had been keeping. The Coast Guard, since the 1700s, had been keeping records of high tides and were able to use that information to determine an average or a mean elevation of the sea level because the ocean's not flat all the time, one exact level all the time. It rises and lowers, so we want to use an average sea level. That's what mean sea level's for. Well, what they found out as the years went by was that mean sea level on the Gulf Coast and the Pacific Coast and the Atlantic Coast were three different things. It wasn't the same everywhere. And in places like Chicago, they were measuring mean sea level basically off of the water levels in the Great Lakes, which was different again. So they weren't on the same level everywhere you went. And so it wasn't a, a good measurement tool like they thought it was. So then they switched in 1988 and they redid it and they called it North American Vertical Datum 1988. Our flood maps today that we have if they were made generally speaking after about the year 2005, they will be in North American vertical datum of 1988. We didn't just automatically go to 1988 datum when we were making flood maps in 1989 on forward because some map projects take a long time to make. Some map projects had had good studies and they brought the 1929 study forward as part of the remapping project to save money. But in general, all of the newer, better flood maps we have in Kansas are in the 1988 data. And you'll find that information in the maps. And you'll notice here underneath the red letters that say unique identifier, you look right underneath that, you'll see boxes to check for NGVD 1929 or NAVD 1988. I've seen some of these that were filled out before and the box wasn't checked. So you gotta kind of watch out for that. Now, we have a section in the form in section B that we talked about yesterday where you write down the base flood elevation. The base flood elevation and the benchmark may be two different versions. A good solid older benchmark might be in 1929 datum, but our base flood elevation on our maps might be in 1988 datum. Well, those things need to be lined up or else we're doing an apples to oranges comparison when we're shooting our floor elevations for the rest of this section. Now, talked about the National Geodetic Survey. This is the NGS website. You can actually go to this website and you'll see dots all over where these benchmarks are. So it's kind of a deal where you can search this website and find a benchmark in the area you're, you're working in. Now, back in the old days, FEMA actually used to put benchmark information on flood maps. And what happened was surveyors used to call me and they used to call FEMA and they say, hey, your flood maps are wrong because the benchmarks have been moved or they're no longer there, so you need to redo your flood maps. So FEMA stopped putting benchmarks on flood maps and they started uh, putting this note on the flood maps that says, if you have questions about benchmarks, call the NGS. And it put the phone number for the NGS in big bold letters there. So FEMA just pretty much got out of the benchmark maintenance business by making this statement on their flood maps at that point. There did used to be benchmark information on the older maps. Let me show you one. This is a map for the city of Ellis. This map is still current. The city of Ellis is in a project right now to get new flood maps. And we hope that within about a year, they'll have brand new flood maps for the city of Ellis. But right now, this map is the one they're working from. And this is just a small section of that flat map to show you what it looks like. But these notes are on the index map panel for the city of Ellis. Um, reference mark one is at elevation 2125.19, and it's the north cap bolt on the top flange of a fire hydrant. We had a tornado in the city of Ella, in uh, Chapman. After the tornado was finished, they were coming in and houses had to be elevated that were in, destroyed in the floodplain and being rebuilt. And they had a note about it a top bolt on a fire hydrant on their map at that time. And that fire hydrant had been relocated. It wasn't even at that intersection anymore. They'd moved it a half a block down. 
So that created some consternation because a surveyor tried to shoot off of the wrong fire hydrant in the wrong location. Reference mark two, if you see it, nail in the top of the first fence post east of the middle entrance of St. Mary's Cemetery. Okay, so this map was made in 1983 and it takes several years to make a map. They don't just say, I'm gonna make a map and tomorrow FEMA whips one out. So 1983 was nearly 40 years ago. How many of you think maybe that that nail might have rusted out by now and be gone? And what happens if somebody else came along and needed to post a sign and they drove a nail into that fence post and posted a sign and then left? So these were not good solid benchmarks and they don't have any unique identifiers for them. I have actually seen uh, elevation certificates that said uh, for, for benchmark, it said spike and tree. That's what it said. Didn't say oak tree, pine tree, which tree, where the tree is located, just said it was a spike in a tree and that's what I used. Now then, today, technology's taken over. We are meeting through the glory of technology right now. We are not in a classroom together. I'm not speaking to you in person. I'm coming to you over the internet. And a lot of surveyors are starting to use these new technological tools to do surveys based on 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 uh, si online positioning user services. So there might be a base station that transmits a signal and they have a, a satellite dish looking thing on top of a tripod that picks up that signal and they use that for their survey. They're actually pretty slick deals. I, I was working with a guy who showed me how to use one one time. It's a lot easier than having to walk around <laughs> with, a, with a stick with lines drawn on it. Anyway, if you use one of those type of surveys where you're getting a signal from a base station, you need to put that information on the elevation certificate, state what base station you used as your benchmark for that survey, and attach the OPUS report to the elevation certificate. So if you're a community official and you see a note under the benchmark about a base station, then you're gonna to wanna to see an OPUS report attached to the back of the elevation certificate. I hope that's making sense. <laughs> It'll make sense the first time you see one. Now, a minute ago, I was talking about the 1929 datum and the 1988 datum. This picture of the United States is a sort of a graph that shows the differences between the two datums. So if you look at the, the shaded blue area, in eastern half of Kansas, it's it's showing you that the the difference between the two datums is between zero and 20 centimeters. Through the middle part of Kansas, it's 20 to 40 centimeters. If you go out to the very west edge of Kansas, you see kind of a white line under some very pale blue. That white line is our border with Colorado and that pale blue, your difference can be 40 to 60 centimeters. Now there are about 39 inches in a meter so if you were at a spot where it was 50 centimeters, you could take 39, take half of it, you'd have about 19 and a half inches. So near the Colorado border, there were, could be places where the difference between the two datums is 19 and a half inches. And if something was measured and built to the wrong datum, they were making an apples and oranges comparison against the BFE and they could build a building incorrectly by 19 and a half inches. So I don't wanna have 19 and a half inches of water in a house out in Western Kansas. Now it's a little easier in the Eastern part of the state because the difference isn't as big, but it still can be a big difference. So, so always keep that in mind. Now, how do we correlate these two datums? There's actually a website called VertCon. You can Google it. You can go on the VertCon website and you can type in a latitude and longitude and it will spit out the difference in the elevations exactly for that point. It's a, it's a way of converting the numbers. Now here's what it says in section T, C2 of the form and I'll, I'll show you a screenshot of it in a minute, but I type it up into, in a big easy to read things here. So C2A is the top of the bottom floor. If you're not sure where C2A should be measured, we have those good diagrams in the instructions. And we were talking about this when we talked about A7 in our section A of the elevation certificate class. And I'm gonna show you some more pictures of those in a minute. C2B is the next higher floor. 
C2C is always going to be NA for not applicable in the state of Kansas. And that's because we don't have any coastal zones in Kansas. All right, the ocean hasn't reached here yet. C2D is where you would measure the attached garage floor. If there's no attached garage, do not leave it blank. Write NA in there for not applicable. If you leave it blank, there are people and in insurance companies and people who work for FEMA that will assume the surveyor forgot to measure the garage. So if you're a community official and you know the house has, a, has, has no garage and it's handed you the form and it doesn't say NA on there and it's just blank, hand it back and ask them to write NA on the line. Lowest elevation of machinery and equipment is C2E. We're going to spend some time talking about that. Lowest adjacent grade. The big thing about lowest adjacent grade, it's not used for insurance rating purposes. But remember that this document can become a supporting document for a request for a letter of MAP amendment. And if you're requesting a letter of MAP amendment, lowest adjacent grade becomes very important. Highest adjacent grade. That's used typically more in section E of the form. We'll talk about that. And the lowest elevation of the adjacent grade for the deck or stairs. So if you had like a, a house with deck coming off the side of it, you would measure the deck posts or the stairs coming off the bottom. And what's the elevation for those? Now, the top of the bottom floor, C2A, might be inside of a crawl space. A lot of crawl spaces have openings that you can get underneath of there, like simply so the plumber can work on the pipes under the house, but some of them are all closed up and you can't get inside. So these instructions are in the actual instructions in the elevation certificate. So FEMA put it in writing in the instructions right there for you, what to do in a situation where you can't access the crawl space. One of these examples says to do something like measure from the floor elevation down to the ground, subtract the elevation you had from the, from the floor elevation, and then make a mathematical assumption that the interior of the crawl space would be at this certain level. It's an assumption. It's a, an approximation of it. And I know as a surveyor, a lot of my surveyors like to be exact. They don't like to be approximate, but sometimes you just can't get into a crawl space. If you use a method like this, if you're forced to, then you would make notes in the comments section of the elevation certificate to explain what you did and how you did it. It's got two other methods here. One of the methods is to see if the building inspector for the community had records of the, of the crawl space. And one of them is to see if you can go inside the building. Maybe there's a trapdoor type arrangement inside the building you can lift up and then measure down from there. Now this is section C2, the full blown thing, snipped and clipped so you can see what it looks like. I just had typed it out earlier to make it easier to read. I went ahead and put NA on, on line C2C right there for you. By the way, do you see where it says check the measurement used with feet and meters? I once had a surveyor, nice guy. He was filled out everything correctly, but he got in a hurry and he checked the box for meters instead of feet all the way down the line. That's what they use in Puerto Rico. They use meters. In the rest of the United States, we use feet. Well, because he had checked meters, it kind of threw the whole elevation certificate in question. And uh, I contacted him. He filled out a brand new one and faxed it to me within the hour. So we got that taken care of. Here are some common mistakes I see in section C2 of the form. So C2A, top of the bottom floor, I've had houses that had a cellar under them, an unfinished basement level. So I've had surveyors who thought that their client's flood insurance would be more expensive if they included that as the top of the bottom floor and they think and they didn't think their client should have to pay for flood insurance on something that was basically a gravel a gravel floored hole underneath the house a cellar unfinished like that they also thought that because it didn't have a cement floor it shouldn't count anyway so they made a judgment call and didn't didn't write down the top of the bottom floor as being the basement floor that's not the surveyor's job to make that call. <laughs> surveyor's supposed to just go and fill out the form as accurately as possible and shoot what's there. If you 
document that there is an unfinished cellar underneath the house. It could affect their flood insurance. It very well could. Nevertheless, that's how the form is supposed to be filled out. We'll have a two-story house. And sometimes what happens is they leave either line C2A or C2B blank. Sometimes they'll also put the same exact number in C2A and C2B. I've seen that before. But if you have a two-story house or a house with a crawl space, there needs to be something in both lines C2A and C2B. C2C has been left blank before. It should always be an A because we're not at the ocean right here. Talked about the attached garage already. Line C2E was left blank or not documented in section E. So C2E is where it asks you for the lowest elevation of machinery and equipment. Maybe it's, uh, as example, a heat pump on the northwest corner of the house on a slab. Then you would write down in the comment section, heat pump northwest corner of the house on a slab. And then in C2E, you would give the elevation for the top of that slab that that heat pump is sitting on top of. One of the common mistakes that we have on these goes back to large commercial and industrial buildings that have a long flat roof and they have utilities sitting on top of the roof. And I've had surveyors who didn't get on a ladder and climb up on top of the roof to measure what the utilities were up on top of that roof. Yep, you have to go up and measure on top of the roof if there's an air conditioning unit or something like that up on top of the roof and say, that here's how high it was. Is it going to affect their flood insurance? No, because it's on top of the roof and it's really high. But if you leave the form blank on that line and don't measure it, that's going to cause their insurance to become more expensive. C2F is your lowest adjacent grade. So I like to look at C2F and C2H and compare them to line B9, the base foot elevation, to see if the ground around the building is higher than the water's predicted to reach. And if the water is not is going to be able to reach the building because the ground around it is higher than the water's predicted reach. Bang, that tells you this property owner qualifies for letter map amendment. If you can get help them fill out the forms to get a letter map amendment, they're going to save a whole lot of money on their flood insurance. It's also going to increase the resale of their value of their home in the future and help protect their investment in their home. Are they going to like you better if you help them save money? People always like you better when you help them save money. C2G, the highest adjacent grade, we don't really see too many mistakes on that, but this becomes more important in section E. All right, these are some of the building diagrams that we actually looked at in our section A class. And we're coming back to the building diagrams because one aspect of the building diagrams is that it shows you on the building diagrams where to measure points for C2A and C2B. So you could just find each and every building type when you go to the field and see what it says there. So I'm looking at something and it might say that the building diagram is 2A, that's a basement. And it'll say that C2A is a certain number and I'm gonna make up a number and I'm gonna say 1010.4. And then I look at B9 and I look at the base foot elevation. And it says that the base foot elevation is 1,007.6. Then I look at the lowest adjacent grade. And it says the lowest adjacent grade is 1,005.2. So I got a base flood, I've got a base flood elevation and a ground elevation that are both several feet below the floor elevation. So how can the floor of the basement be below grade on all four sides if it's several feet above the adjacent grade? Then I'll look at the pictures on the elevation certificate and I can see window wells in the foundation. And I can see this house clearly has a basement and that the floor of the basement's underground. And I'll know somebody made a mistake and didn't, didn't fill out the elevation certificate correctly. All right, so here's a couple of pictures that we've seen before, but we're gonna look at them again to talk about them in a new way. So building diagram 1A is a slab on grade. I look at the sketch. The sketch says to measure line C2A at the top of the slab. Then I find the top of the slab in, in the picture of the house, and that's gonna be where I'm gonna measure C2A. C2D is the top of the garage floor, and you can see where the garage door is over at the right-hand side of the picture. 
So pretty much right almost where you're looking at that garage door, where that garage door opens will be the top of the slab for the garage door, for, for the garage floor. This is a single story house. There is no second story on it. So in this case, there is no next higher floor because there's just a slab underneath and an air above. So no next higher floor. So C2B should be NA. It should not be left blank. It should be NA. Back of the same house, talking about the same things again. Here is the lowest elevation machinery equipment, C2E. It's going to be this air handling unit on this, this metal stand on the south side of the house. Sometimes you're going to have window wells. This confuses the point when you're filling out section C2F of the form. So the lowest adjacent grade is going to most likely be the bottom of the window well. There could be intervening higher ground all the way around, and that's wonderful. But we're going to write down that intervening higher ground in comment section D with a note explaining there's intervening higher ground around the window well at this elevation. That's not important for flood insurance purposes, but it becomes very important if you use your elevation certificate as a supporting document to request a letter of map amendment. In the picture over here at the lower right, you can see a truck ramp. This is the kind of truck ramp where they dig a sloped ramp down into the ground so they can back the truck up to the building. And then when they're loading equipment into the truck, they can drive the forklift right into the truck and everything will be at the same level. Then they can pull the truck up out of the hole. But that also means your lowest adjacent grade is gonna be at the bottom of that ramp because when it's raining and pouring, that ramp's gonna fill up with water. So they're gonna consider that as being a point where water could come in contact with the foundation of the building. Again, gradient is not really used for insurance rating purposes, but it becomes very important when you're requesting to have changes made to FEMA's flood map. There's an actual photo to go along with the sketch that you just looked at. So C2F would be marked down at the bottom of the ramp. And then we would explain that there's higher ground at the top of the ramp. That's gonna be comments D. So C2E we talked about is the elevation of machinery and equipment. So uh, here's the machinery and equipment. And I can't tell you how many times that I've seen this where somebody elevates a house and puts the equipment down on a slab on the ground. And you can see in this picture that there's a high water line uh, with, a little, with a debris line right on this piece of equipment. And FEMA did a study about 10 years or so ago. And in their study, they found out that they were paying out a lot of flood insurance claims on HVAC units and central air units and that kind of thing, heat pumps. All of this type of stuff was sitting outside down on the ground at a lower level than the rest of the building. The building was elevated properly, but the utilities weren't. And because FEMA was having a lot of trouble with that sort of thing, they then made it my responsibility to fix it all. And now it's my responsibility to ask all of you and look at all of your elevation certificates and make sure that in your towns, your utilities are elevated just like your buildings are. That's written right into the grant that pays my salary. Now, here are some utilities in an attached garage. This is kind of an interesting little, little hiccup in the insurance game. The utilities, C2E, see the little E in blue with white letter, is pointing at something that looks a little bit like a heat pump. It's a great sketch. So that heat, that uh, there's hot water heater is what it is. That hot water heater, they're usually inside, but if that hot water heater was down on the floor of the garage instead of being elevated on that stand, it would trigger a requirement that flood insurance would be rated at the bottom floor of the garage instead of at the floor of the house. The way to get around that would be to make sure that the garage has proper flood openings. Now, what if that wasn't a hot water heater or something else, furnace unit or something? So what if they had, a, had that in, instead of being down on the floor of the garage, it was outside the garage at the exact same level as the floor of the garage? One of those hiccups with flood insurance that just kind of drives me crazy. It would be the utilities being down at a lower level would cause the flood insurance to be about 5% higher. But 
the lowest floor for rating the rest of the house would still be at the floor of the house and not at the bottom of the garage. This is complicated stuff. I'll show you some more about that in a minute. But it would make the insurance change by about 5%. However, if you were to change the rating to the bottom floor of the garage for the whole building, that could make the flood insurance about six to seven times higher, a 700% increase in flood insurance, whether it's inside or outside. So this business of utilities in the garage becomes very important. And while I've got this picture up, I'll point out that C2F is your lowest adjacent grade. C2D is your elevation of the, the attached garage, which is the slab for the garage. This is a screenshot that I stole from FEMA, shamelessly stole it. The FEMA deputies are gonna come and arrest me any minute. But it was an online course called IS1102. Anybody can sign up for this course and take it. Just do a Google for IS1102 FEMA course, and they have a course on elevation certificates that you can take. And they explained what I was just talking to you about in a little story about Laura's new garage. <laughs> and uh, so you don't have to memorize what I just said. I've got it all printed out for you. The other thing I want to tell you is there's an IS1103 and an IS1105. These are all courses that take a little over an hour to take. They are all about elevation certificates. One is geared more towards surveyors. One is geared more towards property owners. One is more of a general for anybody like us dumb old floodplain managers like me. Uh, I know that some of the people that are listening in today need CFM credits. You can take these IS1102, 1103, 1105 courses. And at the end of the course, it will give you a multiple choice quiz you fill out the quiz questions. If you score 75%, they printed out a certificate and you can turn that in for CFM credits. This is the insurance agent's lowest floor guide. This is a page from it. Do you notice that the sketches in the insurance agent's lowest floor guide look an awful lot like the sketches from the elevation certificate instructions? That's, that's all done on purpose. So it tells you in the notes next to each sketch, tips for insurance agents on how to rate the flood insurance for that building. And it'd be handy to flip through this if you're a floodplain manager, because as I've said time and time again, you know a couple of tricks about how to save money on flood insurance and you can help a citizen save money. They're gonna appreciate the fact that you saved them money. They're gonna like you better. They're gonna tell the mayor to give you a raise. Eh, maybe not but they're still gonna like you better. And that creates what I call political goodwill. And political goodwill is like money in the bank because when the times get tough, you spend that political goodwill to make things better. Now, issues and problems on elevation certificates can cost people money. This is an actual elevation certificate. Now, line A7, it's got a red arrow pointing at it. It says it's building diagram two. Okay, this is a mistake because it should say 2A or 2B. So it just says two. Here's the honest truth. What happened was they only added the A and the B behind the letter two a few years ago. And a few years before that, there was only one building diagram one. They added one A and one B about 10 years ago. So I've got some surveyors who've been doing elevation certificates for 20, 30 years, older guys, almost my age. And they're just in the habit of writing a one or a two. And when FEMA updated the forms, they forgot because out of habit, they just wrote a number without the little letter designator behind it. Still in all, it's a mistake, but we know it's either gonna be a basement with a patio that you can walk out onto or just a basement that's below ground all the way around. So we know it's some sort of a basement. We know that much. We also know from looking at section A9, that there's an attached garage and the attached garage is 900 square feet and that the attached garage has zero flood openings. It has no flood openings. So because it has no flood openings, it's not really a compliant garage. So if this non-compliant garage has utilities inside of it, then the bottom of the garage floor could become the rating for, for flood insurance purposes. We also know that this uh, crawl space <laughs> He called the garage a crawl space, and you'll figure out why when you look at C2E in a minute. It's 1,680 square feet of enclosed area, and it has 480 square feet of crawl space openings, flood openings. 
that's not enough. The typical ratio that's required is one to one. So, so line C to A8C should say 1680. Now I circled the base flood elevation in line B9, 1180.4, keep that number in mind. That number was determined by the community. So the floodplain manager in town determined what that number was. This is a zone A floodplain. Now we're gonna go down and look at section C because we're here to talk about section C today. So section C, the top of the bottom floor is 1179.5. The base flood elevation is 1180.4. So the bottom of the floor is nine tenths of a foot below the base flood elevation. This is new building. So this is a new building that was built incorrectly. The next higher floor is 1185.0. So it is five and a half feet above the bottom floor and it's about 4.6 feet above the base foot elevation. We're ready for that. However, because this is a basement situation, flood insurance will be rated at line C2A. All right, now look at uh, C2F, lowest adjacent grade, 1181.8. Look at C2H, that's the Decker stairs, 1180.5. Both of those numbers, the grade numbers are higher than 1180.4. So we know the water could never actually reach this house. So what they should do is to correct a problem, they should file for a LOMA using this elevation certificate as a supporting document. And they could say, look, this house is in the floodplain, but it shouldn't be because the ground is higher than the flood water is predicted to reach. That would solve all the problems they're gonna have with their no openings in their garage, not enough openings in their crawl space and their, their diagram two, not having a letter behind it. It fixes everything here if they file for Loma. They haven't filed for Loma yet. I talked to the floodplain manager and he's just not interested in being somebody's hero and helping them save money. What can I tell you? Now, Another little tricky thing about this, it's five and a half foot tall, this crawl space. So it's more than five feet high. And if you were in the class about building diagrams, you remember there's a special building diagram for a below grade crawl space that's only allowed in certain circumstances, but it can never be more than five foot difference between those two. This one is just a half a foot too high to be called that special building diagram, diagram nine. All kinds of tricks is elevation certificates. Now, this is an older style version of an elevation certificate, but it makes a nice easy sketch. And you've actually seen a picture of this before with the hot water heater. Now you can't see section B9 here, but for this example, the B, B9 would have said 485. So if B9 was 485, C2A is 486, that's one foot higher. Hooray, this is, this is going good. Top of the next higher floor, there isn't one. This is a single story house, it's not on a crawl space. Okay, the attached garage is 482.5, two and a half feet, uh, two and a half feet below the base foot elevation, three and a half feet below the next higher floor. C2E, those, that's that utility, uh, probably a hot water heater again, and it's elevated on a platform. If that hot water heater was down in the flood water sitting on the floor of the garage instead of being on a platform, that would put the utilities two and a half feet below the base foot elevation. That would mean the floor of the garage would be two and a half feet below the base foot elevation. On a $150,000 house, the flood insurance would be well over $4,000 per year on a new post firm building at two and a half feet below the BFE. Yep, so it makes a big difference uh, if the because it's elevated and it's installed properly, flood insurance is going to be calculated at one foot above. And so it'll be more in the range of $750 a year for the flood insurance. All right, so now we've talked about section C2 quite a bit. It's time to get into section D. Section D is not bad. All you have to do in section D is fill out the comment section and sign the form. I don't ever get any mistakes with the surveyors filling out this section wrong with ask for their name and information, but sometimes they forget to add important comments. What are the important comments? Location of the equipment from C2 or E4, engineered flood openings. If you have engineered flood openings, you don't want to say 
It's a Flood Deluxe Model 1900 flood opening. And if it comes with a certificate, attach a certificate to the back of the store of the form. Benchmark information. So what's your benchmark? Where is it? So if you have a unique identifier number and you might say, okay, it's PID 11087. And in the comment section, you'd say it's a brass disc set into the side of a bridge abutment. If the adjacent grade to measure that the openings were one foot above grade was done from the interior, you'd make a note of that in the comments. Datum conversion. So if you had to go to VertCon and convert the datum, that goes here. If you had to measure the crawl space using one of those estimated methods, explain the instructions, explain that here. If the measurements were taken under construction, explain how far along the construction was. The data source for G1. So G1 is a section that's sometimes very rarely filled out by the floodplain manager and the floodplain manager might take a base flood elevation or another elevation from another source. So the floodplain manager would write what that other source was in that to explain it here. Section E needs to be based on natural grade. If it's not, explain that. If you have an unusual building diagram, we had a country club one time. Country club was next to a little stream on a golf course. It had a deck where diners could sit out at picnic tables above the stream and eat their picnic lunches that, were, that was brought out to them by waiters in fancy suits. Underneath the deck, there was a little, oh, kind of like a wide sidewalk. They would drive golf carts down that wide sidewalk underneath the deck and then turn and drive them up underneath the building. And there was an area underneath the building about five foot high where they parked golf courts underneath the building. The top edge of the building was wide enough that it sat out on the higher ground, not above the stream. One end of it was a slab on grade but the ground wasn't level. And so to make everything level, they'd put a crawl space under the other end of it up there that the building sat on. So now the whole thing is level. The back half is supported on piers and posts above the stream. The front half, part of it's a crawl space the, and part of it is slab on grade. That's an unusual building. <laughs> so you wanna explain that in the comments section. There's a little note to surveyors about what they're actually signing for on this form. Can a surveyor be, <laughs> Could a surveyor get in trouble for signing information they know is incorrect? Yeah, they could. Has a surveyor ever done that? I know of one case in Kansas where I'm about 99.9% .9 certain a surveyor did that. And I know why he did it. And I can tell you that story, but we're kind of running low on time. So new development, section E. So section E of the form can be filled out by anybody. A property owner could do it. Somebody with no licensing at all. Floodplain managers could fill out section E of the form. So if you have a house in zone AO, and zone AO is a shallow floodplain, and it'll often say on the flood maps, AO with a number by it, a number one, two, or three. If it says three, that means the flood water is three foot deep. If it says one, it's one foot deep. If it says AO with no number, then you automatically assume two foot deep. Well, to measure two foot deep, you just go out and you find the highest adjacent grade around the building, and you take a yardstick and you set it on the ground and you see if the floor of the building is 24 inches above the ground. That's how you measure it. And then you fill out this form based off the measurements you're gonna take with a yardstick right there. You don't have to have a GPS unit. You don't have to have a survey, uh, have a surveyor come out. Anybody can fill this out in section AO. Now the instructions for the elevation certificate say that in an A zone, an unnumbered A zone, you can also use this section. That's true for FEMA, but it's not true in the state of Kansas because in the state of Kansas, we require that all buildings in A zones be built one foot above the base foot elevation. If there is no base foot elevation, you have to have one calculated. We spent quite a bit of time talking about where and when to get base foot elevations calculated already. So I shouldn't be seeing section E filled out in A zones. I should only be seeing section E filled out in AO zones. There are some NFIP reform acts, which will change how flood insurance is rated. And so section E for an older pre-firm house might save them money on flood insurance. It's gonna be done on a case by case basis. So it might be worthwhile to fill out section E and also section C for an older pre-firm house that's trying to save money on flood insurance and have the insurance agent decide which, which section would save them the most money. 
Now, section E5, zone AO. If no flood depth is available, <laughs> okay, here's what it says in all of our community ordinances. This is typical language, and I've put the highlight of the part in, in yellow. If you go at least two feet, if there's no depth number for the AO zone specified right on the map. I personally dislike it, AO zones, and as part of our new flood mapping projects, we're trying to get rid of as many of them as we can. There will only be a half a dozen of them left in the state of Kansas by the end of this year. Okay, this is the Kansas administrative regulation. This is what it actually says. This administrative regulation goes to our state statute. So it says if zone AO is not specified, okay, so you kind of have to read backwards. If the flood map says AE, just says A, then that's not saying AO, so AO is not specified, okay? So if AO is not specified, then the lowest floor of any substantially improved residential structure shall be elevated at least one foot. So to know if we're elevated at least one foot above base foot elevation in an A zone, to comply with this rule, we have to have a base foot elevation calculated. <coughs> this is a form with the yellow and the red on it that is handed out to the CRS communities. And the contractors for FEMA who, who monitor the CRS program say that the blocks that are completed in, in highlighted in yellow must be filled out completely and accurately. I'm gonna tell you that as far as the state of Kansas is concerned, every single block must be filled out completely and accurately. But if you wanna see this form, the CRS people call it the gig list. Get with Cheyenne, she can email you a copy. One of the things I'll tell you, if you're a floodplain manager and, and a surveyor gives you a form and it's got blank spaces on it or something's not filled out because they didn't feel like they could measure it, just don't accept it. Don't issue a building permit. I'm gonna skip no rise certificates, not really part of the elevation certificate instruction. Just remember you need one if you're dealing in a floodway. Buildings can be elevated on fill or crawl spaces. The difference is when you have a crawl space that's down in the water, the crawl space is part of the foundation of the building. And so that building will always, always be considered part of the floodplain. If you elevate on fill, the fill material is not part of the foundation of the building. Therefore, they could apply for letter map revision on fill. Here's a shed. You would actually have to do an elevation certificate for this shed to verify that the utilities, that electrical box, is above the base foot elevation, like it says in your regulations. If this shed didn't have an electrical box on it, you could probably get by without doing an elevation certificate. Here's a shed that's elevated. My granddad had one like this. You can see it's got an air conditioner unit in it. This thing probably has a work workbench inside and a bunch of tools, just like my granddad had. He called it his puttering shed. That's where he went outside to putter with his tools and get away from my grandmother. You would need an elevation certificate to tell you the elevation machinery equipment and how high the floor is to see if it's elevated above the base flood elevation. Here's a garage. This is a detached garage. There is a regulation. It's part of the Homeowners Flood Insurance Affordability Act that says if you have a detached garage on a residential property that it can be exempted from mandatory flood insurance as part of a bank loan. So sometimes you will have cases where a bank or an insurance company says, we don't need an elevation certificate for that garage because we're not gonna require flood insurance. However, as floodplain managers, if you have somebody building a garage in your floodplain, whether it needs flood insurance or not, you still have to have a permit and you still have to have proof that it's built in compliance with your regulations. Now, if you have any questions about what I've said here today, you just simply read the elevation certificate instructions. And then if those instructions don't answer your questions, you know what to do, call Cheyenne. Here's a few places you can learn some more information. My phone number is right there at the top. We have an excellent uh, flood program specialist for FEMA assigned to the state of Kansas, His name's Don Masterson. And I believe he's on the line today. If you need information about flood maps, if you need some of these documents, do a web search form for the FEMA's library. You can order books from FEMA at 480-2520. There's a lot of good information out there. Floodsmart.gov, there's a funny story about that. I wish I had time to tell it where that site went offline because FEMA didn't own the rights to their own website. It's back online now and they're slowly building it up and making it better.
This is the elevation certificate document. It's a really good little booklet on how to do elevation certificates. It's a little out of date, but it's still a good booklet. I talked about how to find a surveyor yesterday. I'm not gonna go into this too much today, but simply go to this Kansas Society of Land Surveyors website, click the get started button, takes you to a list of surveyors who do business in your area. And Cheyenne's name is on top because always, always, always call Cheyenne first, right Cheyenne? Yeah, all right. I'm glad she's on mute, okay. <laughs> Cheyenne, I think that's it. We can take some questions. Okay, thanks Steve. Um, so. So far, there aren't any questions in the chat, but if anyone would like to ask a question, feel free to unmute yourself. It's hard to type questions in chat after you've fallen asleep from listening to me drone on. <laughs> okay, I think uh, Jacob may have had a story. Yeah. Okay. No, no interesting stories this time, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well. That's too bad, Jacob. Yeah. Jacob, I had a surveyor down in South Central Kansas that told me about he had uh, he had had one of those deals where he drove a stake in the ground and then he black wrapped a black tape around the stake. He said you have to build this high. The property owner's brother-in-law unwrapped the tape and then wrapped it around the stake at a lower point as a practical joke. It was not a very funny practical joke. Oh, that, that's pretty funny. <laughs> it's a funny story for me to tell. It's not funny for the surveyor it's not, and the property it's owner. Funny, but unfortunate. Yep. Yep. That actually happened. Any Anybody got any questions, clarifications? All right. We are putting together a class on the difference between LOMAs and LOMAR Fs because we talked about those a little bit today. And that class will be offered sometime in the coming winter. 